So, Judith Lindel is a professor of computer science at Bar Ilan University. He received his bachelor's and master's degrees in computer science in 1997 and 1998 from Bar Ilan University. He then continued to learn towards a PhD at Weizmann Institute, where he did his doctorate thesis under the guidance of Odette Goldweich and Moni Noo. I will soon finish, and then he, will, he has a different height than, my, than me. Uh, by the way, this makes him the academic uh, grandchild of uh, Manuel Bloom. I don't think that we ever had uh, in the same conference, in the same day, a PhD adv advisor and an advisee. Now we have a chain of length three: uh, Manuel, Moni, and Yudelindo. This is a record that will be hard to surpass in future days. Yuda's main research interests are in cryptography, with a focus on secure protocols. His research concentrates both on questions of feasibility and efficiency of such protocols, with the goal of showing that secure computation has potential for real-world use, and many real-world problems can already be solved today. Uh, Yuda published over 80 journal and conference papers and three books, one of which is the excellent textbook of uh, co-authored with Jonathan Katz, Introduction to Modern Cryptography, and today he will talk about this title. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. I'm going to talk about uh, highly efficient secure two-party computation. And uh, I guess quite a long road, although it's pretty short in, in uh, global terms, but uh, the 25-year road or yeah, approximately a 25-year road from theory to practice in this field. So I'm also having problem finding which button to press here. Okay, there we go. So uh, we're going to talk about secure computation. I'll start with a general introduction. There are a set of parties that have private inputs, and uh, they wish to collaborate in some way and uh, compute some joint function of those inputs. But while they do that, they uh, uh, want to preserve certain security properties, for example, privacy. And that means that nothing but the output will be revealed. So they have to somehow carry this joint computation without actually giving up the inputs in any way. Correctness meaning that the output's going to be correct even if some of the parties are cheating. And independence of inputs that no party can choose its input as a function of another party's input. So it has to, you basically, each party has to essentially work on its own. And just to uh, motivate this in an example of a, a secure election, then privacy will mean that each individual's vote will not be revealed. So, of course, we know that if one candidate, uh, uh, candidate A won, then uh, if you guess that any individual party voted for that candidate, then you'll uh, have a better probability, but you won't learn anything but which you can uh, derive from the output. Correctness means that even if some subset of parties collude to try and cheat in the election, their best strategy is just to vote for who they want to be elected because they can't do anything beyond that because the actual the, the function will be computed correctly. And the dependence of inputs will mean that you can't vote, make your vote uh, somehow depend on the outcome. For example, this could be good in Israel where uh, you would say, I want to vote for some uh, a party that's never made it into the parliament before, but uh, if they don't make it in, then let my vote go somewhere else or something to that effect. So you can't do anything like that. And uh, as I said, that we want uh, security to be uh, uh, held in the presence of adversarial behavior, and there are two classic uh, adversary models which were considered already in the mid-80s. The first is the semi-honest model, and this is uh, an adversary that's pretty benign. It follows the protocol description, does everything that uh, it's uh, supposed to do, but actually attempts to learn more than allowed. So it tries to look at the protocol transcript and uh, somehow uh, uh, derive information. And although that sounds very benign, it's actually quite difficult to get security, at least in terms of cryptographic assumptions. Uh, what does it model in reality, though? So I, th argue, uh, I argue that it models best inadvertent leakage, and that means basically that uh, I'm guaranteed that nothing more than the output is revealed, uh, and so I don't have to worry about somehow, you know, is, is my data somehow leaking over the, uh, uh, over the internet or something to that effect. It can also be useful in situations where uh, um, the machines being used, for example, a lockdown and somewhere you have some way of uh, ensuring that no one is replacing the code. But in general, that's uh, it's a bit problematic. So it's a pretty benign adversary. It's just a panda. It's not very vicious. Uh, this is a bit more of a malicious adversary uh, and uh, we get a much stronger guarantee. And essentially, a malicious adversary can do anything at once in order to try and cheat. 
Uh, that's unlike a boxer who still has rules to follow. The malicious adversary has no rules whatsoever, and it can do whatever it wants, really, whatever uh, is possible to try and cheat. And this means that even if we're working against uh, parties who uh, are running their own uh, uh, specially designed software to attack our protocol, knowing exactly how our protocol works, then we still have to uh, obtain security. Uh, so just to note how we actually formalize this thing is by comparing the way a real protocol execution works to some ideal world where there is an incorruptible trusted third party that actually carries out the computation for us. So we can all send our input to that trusted party, it will carry out, compute, compute the function and send us back the output. This is an ideal world, just that we don't believe that anybody is truly incorruptible. So uh, it seems like a very, very difficult problem and uh, uh, one that you know, it's not unclear, a priori unclear at all that it's possible to actually solve. But the amazing thing is that very soon after uh, being uh, uh, coming onto the scene, we have amazing feasibility results that, that essentially tell us that any function whatsoever that we want to compute, we can compute securely. So any distributed task that we want to uh, uh, somehow uh, compute, we can do it securely in the presence of semi-honest adversaries and even in the presence of malicious adversaries. So uh, anything can be done and, and uh, peop, you know, cryptographers are sort of used to seeing this but if you're not a cryptographer it's sort of like uh, how is that even possible? Not only, not only can it be done computationally, if you're willing to assume an honest majority or two-thirds majority on ideal channels, you can actually even do this information theoretically perfectly. Uh, so really difficult things can actually be solved. And, and since the 80s, because of these amazing feasibility results, secure computation has been a very, very uh, big focus of the theoretical cryptography community uh, with studies about what assumptions are necessary and sufficient for obtaining secure computation, uh, obtaining security in uh, the presence of stronger adversaries, adaptive corruptions and so, and so on, considering composition, what happens when many different protocols are running together, the same one or many different ones, with a man in the middle, without a man in the middle, many, many different models. And it's really a huge amount of work uh, on this uh, problem for, on the theoretical uh, standpoint. So it's really a, a beautiful and deep theory has been developed. And, uh, and, and, and that's taken us 25 or 30 years. The question is, what's happening now? And in parallel to continued uh, uh, research on the theory of secure computation, there's been very recent interest in the practicality of this problem. And this uh, interest has come also from outside, from, uh, from governments, from industry, security organizations that see secure protection as, as potential. And it's together with uh, recent developments that uh, are much more efficient and these sort of go together. Sort of, there's interest on the out from uh, external sources because they view, well, maybe this can actually be useful. And there's more interest internally in the academic world because there are actually people that are interested in what we're doing, which is sometimes nice, not always. Uh, and and in a, I really think in the last five years we've seen incredible progress on making secure computation practical. And whereas uh, when I started doing secure computation there was never any really thought that you could actually use these things. So it's like a car production, right? For uh, uh, if you want to do zero knowledge for an MP complete problem and you're using a car production, this is not something that we think is really of any. So anyone, no one's actually going to implement such a thing. It's just a proof of feasibility. It's a, it's a general concept. It's not something that you can actually use. And this is the same way that we really uh, uh, relate it to secure computation. But uh, it, this has actually turned out to be really not the case. If we can talk about uh, complicated functions like the AES uh, function, which is, has a Boolean circuit in the tens of thousands of uh, um, uh, gates, and we can do that in tens of milliseconds for the semi-honest, and we can even actually securely compute functions that have over a billion Boolean gates, like edit distance on uh, uh, not small inputs, and this can be done in, uh, in minutes, uh, in just minutes. For malicious adversaries, which is a much, much, much harder problem, and semi-honest, uh, I guess, yeah, for semi-honest, there was more of a feeling this could be used, but malicious adversaries are really, really hard to work against. You somehow have to force the... A malicious adversary, the malicious adversary to follow the protocol honestly and that's very difficult because we sort of have this uh, wonderful tool called zero knowledge and we can make someone prove that they're behaving correctly but making someone prove that they're behaving correctly on a complex protocol means you somehow must use complicated proofs and complicated proofs are not going to be efficient and but it turns out that we can actually uh, do this and, and every year every six months we have some new protocols some new breakthrough and, and, and it's really blistering speed 
And it's very su surprising, uh, at least for some of us, it's surprising for me. And uh, 10 years ago, I don't think that, uh, or maybe some people dreamed, but I, I didn't dream that it'd be possible to get to these sort of speeds so quickly. But Moni uh, was sure about it 10 years ago already uh, when he did his auctions, but uh, I must admit I didn't really believe him. Uh, so uh, so what, what, where are we now with security for semi-honest adversaries, for example? So as I mentioned, we can do secure AES computation, and uh, here uh, uh, with about 10,000 non-SOR gates. Why? So with secure AES, you can look at it in a number of ways, but we can talk about one party holds the, the secret key, the other, hold, other party holds the input, and uh, the second party gets the output but doesn't learn anything about the secret key. You could talk about the secret key being split, shared between two servers, so no one knows the secret key, but they want to carry out the computation. And I'll give an example of why we'd want that in a minute. The point isn't necessarily AES, the point is just a circuit which is, uh, you know, we're not talking about millionaire's problem on, you know, doing less than or equal on 30-bit 30, 30 inputs. We're talking about... Uh, uh, larger inputs, we're talking about large circuits, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands, and even billions. As I mentioned, we even took, can talk about billion sized circuits now. Uh, so, a couple of years ago, we could already do this in 0.2 seconds, and today we can do even better. Uh, we can uh, do uh, recent results of a circuit of over a billion gates in approximately five minutes, which is uh, uh, really impressive. For malicious adversaries, which is, uh, uh, in my opinion, much more interesting, then we can do these sort of things, so something again about 10,000 gates in uh, less than 30 seconds, but actually much faster on uh, if you want to go parallel. But if you're willing to use pre-processing, which in many cases in practice you can use pre-processing, so there have recently been in the last few years a number of protocols, new protocols that say, okay, we have not too expensive, not unreasonable pre-processing, we have pre-processing time that's uh, more expensive, so we, we, we do need to pre-process. But then we can actually get to really fast time, so we can do like 100 AES computations in parallel in about 20 milliseconds, which is... No, you, you gen, you, what you essentially have, you would have uh, uh, pre-processing be running in the background all the time, generating multiplication triples, doesn't really matter. Before you know the inputs. Before you know the inputs, even before you know the function. And then you can quickly, no, you, you always have to, every, every triple can only be used once, but, but you sort of run that in the background and when you need to answer something, you can answer really, really, really quickly, which is actually uh, uh, enough for a lot of applications. Not every application, but a lot of applications. So I want to motivate uh, one example of where this thing would actually be really useful, and then I'll start talking about how we actually uh, get security and how we can do this magic. So let's talk about one-time passwords. We have these uh, secure ID uh, devices that some of us have. Some of us have from other uh, companies. Some of us don't have at all. But ba basically, they're motivated by the fact that users, that people are, are, are really bad at remembering passwords and choosing passwords. And therefore, we uh, want to replace that. And uh, something which happens to have just uh, taken hold in the, in the, uh, is these one-time passwords for many reasons which are not connected to that's really the best way to go, but this is actually what's very, very often used. So you have this device, and inside the device you have a, a cryptographic key, and you're computing some pseudo-random function based on the cryptographic key on the current time or some other uh, uh, value which changes every, uh, at every time you want to log in. And uh, the problem with this, so not the problem, but what, ha what this actually means is that all those cryptographic keys have to be stored on a server. And that server has to carry out the computation to check that uh, the one-time password that was sent was the correct password that was sent. So it's obvious you need to actually do that. Why is that a problem? The problem is that if there is a server breach, then uh, all of those cryptographic keys could be stolen. Now, why do we care about a uh, server being breached? Well, use a firewall. But we all know that nothing is perfect. Nothing can uh, uh, give us perfect security. And, and these things actually happen. So the servers are getting broken into more and more, no matter how much uh, we try to protect against them. And so we somehow want to uh, uh, save us, or well, somehow uh, maintain security or make it harder to, to carry out this attack. The best thing would be to use uh, public key cryptography, then we have public keys on the server, but we're not going to change the world that quickly. In this so, context, do we assume that the Chinese are semi-honest or malicious? The Chinese are, well, I think that their government thinks that they're actually uh, honest, but uh, yeah, very malicious. Uh, so this is right. This is exactly part of the point. A lot of these these attacks are actually government sponsored or sponsored by big uh, by organisations with a lot of money, and that's why it's a very very significant threat. 
So one way to try and mitigate this danger is to take, instead of having one server, uh, one backend server to do the computation, let's split the secret key into two uh, parts and use secure computation. So RSA, the company RSA has uh, such a proposal for static passwords. And here's the uh, um, uh, analogous uh, solution for one-time passwords, you actually have to carry out a computation. So here, you want to, you want to ver verify the validity of this one-time password without ever actually putting the key together and without ever actually uh, seeing uh, um, the secret key. And therefore, if one server is broken into, and even if malware is being run on that server, you still can't, the, the attacker still can't get the secret key. And, uh, and, and therefore, this gives better security. You can refresh the keys to make sure that uh, they have to sort of break in both times, uh, si almost simultaneously to both servers. You can use this for bank transaction signing and many other things. And these attacks actually happen. So RSA, the company, was broken into. Uh, One-time password secrets were stolen. They didn't replace all the devices, possibly because they didn't know what exactly was stolen. And replacing hundreds of millions or, or tens of millions or even millions of devices is uh, something which is very, very expensive and very problematic. A lot of these devices, don't, you can't even reprogram the key inside them. So this is something which just wasn't done. And then Lockheed Martin was attacked. And, and this is a big deal. So secure computation can actually help. Today, we can already do this sufficient enough. OK, let's now get into uh, uh, the more uh, uh, interesting part of the talk, which is how we actually can do these things. And before I start, I just want to talk about a certain paradigm shift which I think has happened recently around study on efficient secure computation which relates to the question of should we be looking at general versus specific protocols. So general protocol is a protocol that can be used to solve any problem. So we take an, some arbitrary representation of the function like a boolean circuit or an arithmetic circuit and then we use that as the basis for our secure computation. And uh, it, was, it was, for many years it was assumed or by many that general protocols will not be able to compete with specific protocols. You know, if I'm looking at a specific problem, uh, I want to solve a specific problem, then I can utilize the structure of that problem and get much more efficient protocols. But today it seems that, although that's true in some cases, in many cases actually the best thing we know how to do are, the, are our general protocols. And not only the best we know how to do, we actually can do that very, very well today. And this has another very uh, big advantage, which is that we get straight away much more, uh, much broader applicability. And instead of trying to guess what people may be interested in using this for, we, uh, uh, they can use what we do for absolutely anything. And, and you know, for years we talked about elections and auctions, but it doesn't seem that anyone is really interested, or some people are a little bit. But there isn't uh, a massive interest in doing a really secure uh, uh, auctions. In Israel, there seems to be more interest in the States. In the States, you just want a nice machine, but that's other people who are working on that. So what am I going to talk about for the rest of this talk? I want to talk about Yarn's protocol. I'm going to talk uh, uh, about how to deal with malicious adversaries. And there are some very uh, interesting and subtle uh, uh, issues that arise when you want to try and prevent attacks by malicious adversaries. And also, I'll finish off with some new developments and, and uh, a recent result. I want to stress that there are other very, very important approaches. And uh, this is just a partial list, but we don't have time to do everything, so we'll just focus on this. So we'll start with the Yao's garbled circuit. Again, we're starting, we're, we're talking about a general protocol. So we have a Boolean circuit that represents the function we want to compute. This Boolean circuit can be very, very large. It can be uh, uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of gates. We're going to have to do, carry out cryptographic computations for every gate of the circuit. Here, specifically, symmetric encryption. That may sound like, well, that can never be efficient enough. That's not true. Uh, this uh, can still be very, very efficient. And the way it works is that every wire in the circuit, we associate, uh, we associate with every wire two random values or garbled values. One is a representation of the zero value and the other is a representation of the one value. And then what we want from this, garbling, this garbled circuit is that if I'm given one value on each input wire, then I can somehow magically compute the output but I won't learn anything within the process. All I'm going to see is random garbage the whole way through. But it's now being given one of the, the garbled value, the one associated with a certain input. So we get 0, 0, 1, 1 will be my input. I'll get the, the function applied to 0, 0, 1, 1, but I actually won't learn anything whatsoever. In fact, I won't even learn that the input was 0, 0, 1, 1, because all I saw were just random values, which is the associated uh, a, a garbled value for each wire, and that reveals no information whatsoever, at least computationally. But how can we construct such garbled circuits? Again, this looks like black magic. So we have here a, a plain AND gate. That's the way an AND gate looks. We're all familiar with that. 
And as I said, we're going to associate a random value with every, uh, 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 two random values to every wire. So we have a wire which is the X wire and a wire which is the Y wire. So we have KI0 and KI1, that would be wire I. We have uh, KJ0 and K0, and that's the Jth wire. And the output is uh, K0L and K1L. And this is the mapping that we want. So if I had both zero wires on the input, I'd want to get the zero wire on the output. Likewise, I had a zero one or a one zero, I'll still want to get the zero output. But if I have one one, I'll want to get the one output. Now obviously I can't let anyone see this table, because if I see this table, I know straight away that this is the one value, because it only appears once, whereas this appears three times. But somehow I want to get that mapping. I want to give a mapping where given two input wires, I'll get the output, but without knowing anything about what's going on. So what we do is we just encrypt, or we double encrypt this. So we take the output K0L and we encrypt it under the each uh, possible pair that I'm spo that's supposed to give me that output. So under 0, 0, 0, 1 and 1, 0. But I'll encrypt the one value on the output wire using the both one keys. And if I give you this in a randomly permuted order, and I give you two of the, two of the uh, uh, just one key on each input wire, you'll be able to get the correct output value, but you won't actually know even what you decrypted. Because you just decrypted twice and you got a value, and you know this is the correct value, but you have no idea if it's a zero value or the one value, because all you see, you've seen is ciphertexts. Now, just note that it has to be some mechanism so that you know which, what you're supposed to decrypt, but we'll just assume for now that you know how to do that. So if I'm given k i alpha and k j beta, then given this table, I can obtain k l of alpha and beta. And as I said, nothing is revealed. And we can now construct a garbled circuit by just simply taking these garbled gates and, and uh, putting them together. So for every, I first assign values to each wire, and then I just uh, uh, construct the garbled uh, gate uh, based on the input and output wires of every gate, and then I can compute. You assume the, the encryption is commutative, but the order is different. Uh, you, we can use many different ways of doing this double encryption. But uh, no, I don't have to assume that. I can do it this way. Is, is, it's, it's symmetric encryption. So this is, for example, you can just do really double encryption this way, or you can use it as a pseudorandom function and mask both ways. It doesn't matter. It does, doesn't have to be commuted. Because the, the wires of the circuit have a certain order. It's not a problem at all. So I can do this, and then once I'm gi if I give you now a single wire for x1, x2, y1, and y2, you can now compute this entire circuit and get, get an output value here. But now you want to actually get the outputs. I'm also just going to give you the translation tables of the output wires only. So if you've got K0F and K1G, you actually know what you don't know what they are, but you look in this table out here and say, ah, okay, so I've got 0, 1. And you learn nothing but the output, and this is the magic of, of Yao. Now, now, the only problem that remains is how do we get these uh, uh, inputs? Because I said I have to give you an input of every wire. I have to give, oops, sorry. I have to give you an input, the, these values here. So P, one party constructs this circuit and can uh, 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 just send the values related to his inputs, but the other party has to get its own inputs, and that's not clear, so we use oblivious transfer for that. And oblivious transfer is more cryptographic magic. We have one party with two inputs, the other party with one, uh, one input bit, which basically saying which of the two inputs of the first party wants to get. And the first party learns absolutely nothing about what it sent. The second party only gets a single value and not both. So uh, actually, this can be done really, really efficiently. But again, that's part of the magic of the last few years, because uh, until very recently, we could only do this very expensively. And uh, now we can actually do this with very, very few exponentiations, uh, assuming uh, DDH. So this is like elliptic curve multiplications, just a couple of milliseconds, and we can do this uh, with efficiency, with security for malicious adversaries even. So how does Yao's protocol work? P1 has X, P2 has Y. P1 constructs a garbled circuit of the uh, uh, computing the function and sends it to P2. P1 then sends the keys which are associated with its own input. So in every input wire, there are two keys, a zero key, a one key. It generates the, it, it sends the keys that are associated with its own input. And then they run oblivious transfer for P2 to get the inputs associated with P2's inputs. And P1 learns nothing from the oblivious transfer and P2 just gets a single key for every uh, uh, every wire, and once uh, uh, it has all of that, P2 can now compute the garbled circuit, get the output, and learn nothing whatsoever except for the output. Okay, so that's fine, and for semi honest the security argument is not difficult, because uh, from the garbled circuit you learn nothing, and you only got one value on the input wire, and P1 learns nothing anyway, so that's pretty easy. The problem is that we want security for malicious adversaries, 
And here's where things start getting difficult. So obviously the biggest transfer has to be secure against malicious adversaries, but as I said, that can be done very efficiently today. A bigger problem is that the circuit may not be correctly constructed. So P1 is now constructing this garbled circuit, which all it is, if you think about it, is just a series of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, ciphertexts with, uh, in a certain order, which tells me what, how I'm supposed to compute it. And P1 can construct this uh, incorrectly. And there's no way that P2 can check that P1 constructed it correctly because this, because it's encrypted. And uh, this is not just a problem of correctness, but of privacy. The reason why it's a problem of privacy is because this function, for example, may reveal a lot more about P2's input than the function is supposed to reveal. For example, P1 can construct a circuit which says, instead of computing... Uh, um, I don't know, uh, the nearest neighbor, then uh, take uh, uh, the nearest neighbor and somehow embed in, some, or take some other value and somehow embed in some more information about P2's input than, than is revealed by the actual input. And there's no problem doing that because uh, P2 can't know what the circuit computes. So how do we uh, prevent this? We use something called the cut and choose technique, which uh, uh, has been used in many, many uh, places in cryptography. And basically what happens is that P1 will construct many copies of the circuit. This is not supposed to make you hungry, but we're getting close to lunchtime, so maybe it will. Uh, P1 constructs many copies of the circuit and sends them to P2. Notice that the, P, the, the circuits within themselves don't reveal any information about P1's input yet because P1 hasn't sent the garbled values or it's related to its own input yet. So P1 sends a whole lot of circuits to P2 and then P2 says, you know what, I want to check you, open half of them. What does opening half of them mean? It means sending the, the garbled values on all of the input wires, and then P2 can go and decrypt all of those tables, because it now has all of the keys and can check that they're all actually, you know, an AND gate is an AND gate, an XOR gate is an XOR gate, and, and etc. etc. And you can just check that really the, the structure is absolutely as it should be. And if it's all fine, then they're going to just, then they'll, com then they'll, they'll uh, run the original YAS protocol on the remaining circuits. So somehow we have some guarantees that the remaining circuits can't be too bad because if there were many, many bad circuits, P2 would have caught P1. So now we know that a lot of the remaining circuits uh, will actually be good because P2 didn't catch P1. But not, not all of them. But not all of them. And that's the big problem. The big problem is that we've solved the problem or we've given a suggestion for a solution, but we've actually opened a Pandora's box of a whole lot of other problems. <coughs> so, uh, and I'll get to the one that you mentioned, that's what I'm going to focus on for the most of the time. So the parties compute many circuits, and, uh, and, and that means we need to force them to use the same inputs in all. That's one problem that happens. So, you know, if, if one of the parties would use different inputs in different circuits, then it would get more, out, get more outputs than it's supposed to, and that will reveal more information that's allowed to. That's one problem. Uh, in order to open a circuit, we said, yeah, open a circuit. Open a circuit just means give the keys on the input wires. But actually... Maybe I can construct a circuit with one set of keys that open the circuit correctly and another set of keys that make it compute a, compute a different function. You have to somehow argue that that's not possible or prevent it. And by the way, such things actually exist. They're called non-committing encryption, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the circuits may be correct, but P1 may actually use incorrect values in the, uh, uh, when giving the, in the oblivious transfers. I won't focus too much on that because I'll focus more on... Uh, all of these problems can be solved and we can solve all the problems. The question is how much they cost. The solutions to these problems actually don't result in too much overhead in terms of computational costs. The big problem is the problem that Anwar mentioned when just uh, beforehand <laughs> is that not all of the unopened circuits are guaranteed to be correct. For example, P1 may just give one bad circuit. And we probably, let's say we open half of the circuits, then we probably one half that bad circuit will not be opened. And then we'll, now we'll have, amongst the circuits that weren't open, we'll have one bad circuit. Now what should P2 do if not all of the computed <laughs> circuits give the same output? What should P2 do? Hmm? What should do? Well, why not complain? P2 knows that P1 is cheating, right? So we can do majority, but why can't P2 just say, okay, I know that you've tried to cheat me because I've seen now I've got two different outputs and if all of the circuits computed the same function and we use the same inputs in all of them, then, we'll, uh, uh, then that will never have happened. But the problem is if P2 complains, it opens the door to a following attack. 
P1 will generate this one bad circuit that I said, and the one bad circuit does the following thing. It says, if the first bit of P2's input is a zero, then output garbage. Otherwise, compute the function correctly. Now, with probability one half, as we mentioned, this circuit's, circuit's not checked. And if the first bit of P2's input is zero, then what happens is that the, uh, this circuit gives garbage. So now P2 got two different outputs, so P2 aborts. It says, hey, P1, I caught you cheating. And therefore aborts. But if the first bit of P2's input is one, P2 sees that everything's fine. So P2 doesn't abort. So just the fact of whether P2 aborts or not reveals the first bit of P2's input to P1. And we get this absurd situation that even though P2 knows that P1 is cheating, P2 can't do anything about it. P2 can't abort and say, I know you're cheating, because then its first bit of input will be revealed. And not only that, next week when P1 says, says P1 comes to P2 and says, let's play again, P2 can't say, I'm not playing with you because I know that you cheat, because then at that point his, his bit of input is going to be revealed. So P2 now has to live in this, uh, 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 a cheat, this uh, relationship of, uh, with this cheat for the rest of his life. It can't get out of it because otherwise it will reveal its input. So what we do is, uh, uh, as uh, Tamir suggested, P2 will take the majority output. And that's fine because we know the majority of the circuits are, are correct, so now the majority output is a good strategy. But, but now we have to some, understand, okay, so we have this majority, we have to understand what's the probability the majority of the circuits uh, that are not opened and are evaluated are going to be correct, and understanding that exact probability has a huge ramification on the efficiency. So here's an inaccurate computation, let S be the number of circuits, the adversary succeeds if a quarter of them are incorrect because we're opening a half. So that we're out of the half that are not open, they're a quarter they're incorrect. So it succeeds if a quarter are incorrect and none of those are checked. If you assume that each one is chosen with probability one half independently, then you'll get a 2 to the minus s over 4. It doesn't work this way, but this is why it's a very rough argument. And then for security of 2 to the minus, 2 to the minus 40, which is a reasonable security, uh, you need 160 circuits. That's quite a lot. Now in 2007, when we did this first, we, did, we bounded it by 2 to the minus s over 17, meaning you need 680 circuits to get 2 to the minus 40 security. And the reason why we did that is because, you know, we just wanted to do something that didn't use uh, general zero knowledge, and we, weren't, we didn't also really fully appreciate the ramification to efficiency of having a not tight analysis. So we proved that. Well, then we improved that to to the minus 0.311s as an approximation. So 128 circuits now suffice to get to the minus 40 security. And then also, as Shalat uh, uh, showed that uh, if you actually don't open a half, but you check 60%, then you can even get better and get to the minus 0.32s, which is 125 circuits. And they also showed that it's optimal. Now that's really bad. It's really bad they showed that it's optimal because optimality means that we're stuck at 125 times the cost of semi-honests. And 125 times the cost of semi-honests is a lot. It means you have to do hundreds of encryptions per gate. But the proof of optimality actually didn't say that you can't do better with any wave type of cut and choose, and you can't do better with Yao. It said that if you work in this way of opening a percentage and then taking a majority of the remainder, then this is optimal. But maybe we can do something different. And uh, the question is, can a variant of cut and choose be used to reduce the number of circuits? And, uh, and that, this is a recent result, which the answer is yes, we can actually do something much, much better. And the problem that we have to deal with is, what does P do do when it receives inconsistent outputs? It's not allowed to complain. Mm. So you want to design a strategy so that P1 can only succeed in cheating if all of the check circuits are correct and all of the incorrect circuits are uh, are uh, uh, evaluated. So, again, all the check circuits are correct and all of the evaluated circuits are incorrect in the, in, in the same way. That's the only way that P1 will succeed in cheating. That's what we want to do. It seems very, very hard, but if we could do this, then we would get that if we're opening half, we would get uh, this probability of cheating because exactly half have to be correct, exactly half have to be incorrect, and, uh, and it has to be, there's only a single choice that will allow P1 to succeed in cheating. And then you would get for 2 to the minus 40 security, the 44 circuits would suffice. And that's already a third, which is great. But actually you can do better, because if you have this strategy where all the checked ones have to be correct and the, the evaluated ones incorrect, then you can actually just choose each one independently with probability one half, 
and then you get 2 to the minus s, so you get an error of 2 to the minus 40 with just 40 circuits, and you know, I'd want to say this is optimal, but I'm always afraid to say something is optimal because who knows what other, what other techniques are out there. But can we actually do this? It seems like something which is very, very difficult to do. So again, we want to make cheating possible only if all of the evaluated circuits are incorrect. <laughs> and the observation is that this problem occurs only if P2 gets different outputs. If it doesn't get different outputs and all gets the same outputs, then uh, uh, this strategy that I mentioned is fine. There's no problem whatsoever. And the idea is that if P2 learns different outputs, then this will somehow give it a trapdoor to learn P1's input. So P2 either gets all the same outputs, but then it's the correct output because at least one of those circuits is correct, so it's fine. Or P2 gets, gets different outputs, but if it gets different outputs, it gets a trapdoor to learn P1's, uh, uh, P1's input. And once it learns P1's input, it can just compute the output itself. It, it learned now X, so compute F of XY by itself. It doesn't need the garbled circuits to do this computation. And P2 still won't tell P1 that it knows that P1 tried to cheat because of that will again uh, give the same attack. But, so P1 can't know though if P2 got all the same outputs in the garbled circuits and got, and got the output that way, or if P2 got the trapdoor and got the output in a different way. P1 doesn't know, and this is what we want to do. And we can actually implement, implement this idea by making all of the output wires have in, in so the ith output wire in all the garbled circuits will have, we actually have the same value. And then P2 will, evalu will evaluate all of the evaluation circuits. And note that uh, um, if everything is fine, P2 only gets a single output value on each output wire, a single garbled value on each output wire. But if P1 cheated, then it's only got two, it would get two different output values, two, both garbled values on a single output wire. And that means that P1 cheated. So they're going to run a new spe special circuit computation just to compute this function where P2 inputs uh, two garbled values and P1 inputs the same input X and we can force that actually quite efficiently that it uses the same input throughout and P2 will get the output uh, will get P1's input if those two uh, values of the input were actually two different values on a garbled wire on, on a single wire and and uh, the question is how to do this secure computation because now I've sort of said okay we don't know how to do secure computation but now I'm going to get back and use secure computation again and the point is that we're going to use one of the previous protocols that needs 128 circuits because the secure computation here can be made very, very small. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So we have this uh, big secure computation where we're going to use 40 circuits. And then we have this small secure computation which costs 128 circuits, but it's a small circuit, so I don't care. It's only giving me a little bit of overhead. And then you have to uh, do a lot of other things as well. For example, you need to have P1 use the same input in all of the circuits. But that's fine because anyway we need to do that. As I mentioned, part of the problems with cut and choose is to make sure the part uses the same inputs in all the circuits. So it doesn't make a difference in both stages. It's part of the same technique and actually can be done very efficiently. Okay. So in conclusion with what we can do now, we can actually achieve malicious security with far fewer circuits than before. So for an error of 2 to the minus 40, it suffices to send 40 circuits. And actually that means that on... You know, modern machines already, many machines have 4, 8, even 16 processors. And in a couple of years' time, I assume that we'll start seeing even 32, uh, uh, 32 uh, um, uh, processors in a single machine. And what that actually means is you're going to get close to uh, semi-honest time on pretty standard machinery within a couple of years' time just by the <laughs> improvements of hardware using a protocol like this. And that's really something which uh, uh, sort of was a dream until very recently. If you run it on a GPU, and then you already have this number. Yeah, uh, yeah, but then using specific hardware, this will, will do uh, yeah, amazing times. Yeah. And uh, so together with existing optimizations and techniques for the other things that we need, we can actually get very, very uh, fast security. So in summary, efficient secure computation is a reality. It's, not, uh, it's no longer uh, uh, just a dream. And uh, even though it sounds intuitively that if you need to do symmetric encryptions, you need to do crypto carry out cryptographic computations for every, every gate in a Boolean circle, this cannot actually be efficient. It's not true. It can actually be very efficient. And we can get, we can get to times that are uh, good enough for real applications, for almost real-time sort of computations. 
like the one-time password uh, authentic uh, verification that I mentioned. Yeah, those garbled circuits can yield uh, very fast protocols, uh, but there's still a bit more to do. And uh, it, but it's, it appears that if you don't, not going to use pre-processing, if you don't have a situation where you can use pre-processing, then Yao is the best that we know. And there are many other approaches, especially these other approaches when you can do pre-processing, uh, have uh, a lot of other advantages. So, thank you very much. Timing, I think, is actually not a problem because, for example, the circuits the, uh, uh, have a, uh, a fixed structure in terms of the number of gates. Now, you might say, but the keys that I choose inside that are used to decrypt, could some, some keys will run faster on AES or, or, and some will run slower on AES, then you reduce the problem to uh, preventing timing attacks on your encryption function. So if, if your encryption function is resilient to timing attacks on the symmetric key that was chosen, then you'll be fine. If not, then I agree, you can actually build, uh, you can, it's not a problem with the number of gates, it could be a problem with the way you choose, choose the keys, but uh, you reduce it to that problem, which is... I have a question. Um, regarding the, uh, you tried to bridge here between theory and practice and uh, you put an emphasis about real life problems. Uh, I'm thinking about problems of uh, privacy preserving data mining. For instance, you have several organizations with databases and they want to jointly compute uh, a classifier or a decision tree or association rules and so right. on. Uh, you don't expect that g general solutions will be, will be applicable in, in such uh, complex okay, so functions. Okay, so in, in that sort of scenario, there are a few things that, that I, I, I can say. Firstly, uh, for malicious, we don't know, I don't think we know how to do anything better than the general. In se for the semi-honest case, uh, in those sort of settings, we can, we can do a lot better, but for malicious, we don't know how to do anything that's better. And part of the problem is because a lot of those protocols utilize uh, computing shares on intermediate information, and then you have big problems on how you do prevent someone from changing that information. So we don't know how to really do anything much better for, uh, uh, okay, for semi-honest. For semi-honest, for, for, for semi uh, I think that, that for semi-honest, for those sort of problems, I think more specific things are, are more realistic. In general, I'm skeptical today that will ever be able to use secure computation to do computation on ever, I would say ever, but to do secure computation on, on uh, databases like terabytes uh, size input. But there are many cases where actually what the problem you're trying to solve involves uh, big databases, but actual computations that are not so big. So for example, uh, work that, uh, that, that Benny uh, did once, which is to do face recognition. So you have, you know, at the airport, you have a camera and you take a photo of a face and you want to see whether it's on the no-fly list then you have a big database of no-fly, but you're actually carrying out individual computa uh, computation where you're comparing face by face. That sort of thing we can do very, very efficiently. Okay. Another question is about, question about practicality. Uh, you spoke here about the usual um, um, setting in which you don't allow any learning of anything beyond the output. But sometimes for getting practical solutions in real life problems, uh, what do you think about allowing uh, a bounded, limited leakage of information that could be considered benign. Of course, it's not you and I who have to decide. It's the practitioner that has to decide whether it is, it is benign or not. What do you think about this? So in, in general, when you can't do what you want to do, then you take relaxation. So at uh, TCC la last week, Tal Malcolm gave a talk on uh, segmentation of big uh, data, which is part of an IARPA project that she's involved in. And there they... Uh, uh, they do allow, they, they have to, because they want to do secure database search on terabytes worth 10 terabyte data databases. And they have to allow some, uh, some leakage, but what exactly you allow needs to be very, very clear. So for example, if you say something like, I allow uh, to see whether the same query was made twice, that's a sort of very, very clear gain. There are other sort of measures and types of leakage which people talk about, which is very, very, very unclear. But then also Tal Malkin mentioned uh, Hugo Kraftschick's uh, quote, which was, uh, 
uh, that all of these things are problematic. So he said, we suck, but it's inherent. So in that sort of case, maybe, you know, that's, that's life. But uh, one has to be very careful with sort of, there are a lot of propositions for different types of measures of leakage, which I'm very skeptical of uh, what they actually mean. Okay. Yes, thank you, speaker again.